Hi, and this is the Physics High Podcast. A quick quiz. Do you, A, want to be inspired by science communicators? B, want to learn all about science education? C, want guidance on your scientific journey? Well, how about D, all the above? Today, my guest is Dr. Magdalena Kirsting. Now, Magdalena is a physics educator, an educational researcher, and a science communicator, and currently is doing her postdoctoral research at the University of Oslo in Norway. Now, she has a great passion for Einsteinian physics, and in particular, general relativity. But really, what she's passionate about is communicating science, make giving students a passion of science through the teaching of modern physics, and in particular, obviously, Einsteinian physics. Now, I had the pleasure of uh, hearing her speak at the LIGO conference last year, and I got a taste of her passion, her infectious personality, that really is excited about educating and encouraging students to explore and chase their passion for science. Welcome, Magdalena. Thanks, Paul. Thanks so much for having me. And uh, what a nice introduction that was. <laughs> from your website and from my readings of what you do, you really have two big things that you are dealing with at the same time. You have a passion for science education and educating others about the wonders of science. And obviously, you have a real interest in Einsteinian physics. Um, could you tell our, the audience a little bit about what you do and uh, in particular uh, what uh, you're currently doing with your postdoctoral research? Yeah, absolutely. And I think before I dive into my uh, current activities at the University of Oslo, uh, I just uh, give you a little bit of my background and idea of uh, the path that has led me to where I'm currently. So by training, I'm a mathematical physicist. So I have studied physics and mathematics, and I've always um, been fascinated by, uh, by abstract ideas and trying to understand the world and the universe, what holds the universe together. So uh, studying physics and mathematics was uh, just a no-brainer for me. But there's something about science and scientific questions that um, stretch your intellect and just, yeah, I don't know, in a way, make you excited about wanting to learn more. And this excitement is something that I want to share with others. So, yeah, being a science educator and a science communicator really combines the best of two worlds, namely the world of science on one hand and the world of sharing this and helping others understand science as well and just sharing not only science but sharing um, our excitement and just yeah, wanting to, to learn more and to grow and to, to be critical. And yeah, so this is for me what I'm doing. I'm involved in, in many different activities, but uh, they all feel like they belong together and they're just different aspects of uh, the same passion um, of, uh, of modern physics and of wanting to understand the world, really. Yeah. And this is a little bit of my background. So what I'm uh, currently doing and what I have been doing for the past years is that I'm uh, a physics and science education researcher. And this means that I'm not only trying to, to educate others, but I'm actually doing research on improving uh, instructional strategies. And this research, for example, entails uh, developing uh, learning resources. So I have developed uh, a digital learning environment about Albert Einstein's uh, general theory of relativity with my colleagues at the University of Oslo. And we used these learning resources to then do research on um, students' conceptions and teachers' uh, struggles and teachers' opportunities when they try to bring these topics uh, to the classroom. So it is really an activity or my work entails developing learning resources, working with teachers like you, um, being in classrooms, interviewing students, um, yeah, analyzing video observations. In my latest project, we try to um, assess the quality of instructional practices in science classrooms. So we have uh, video observation manuals, and uh, yeah, so it's a lot of activities really, but the idea is how can we improve science education? To give our audience a taste of basically what you do, I um, recently read two papers of yours, one about uh, a more intuitive way of teaching uh, how we know the existence of dark matter through the use of jelly 
if I might remember, which I thought were very interesting. Um, I've got already the ingredients ready to do that experiment myself. Um, and then you actually just published a paper just the last uh, few days too, particularly about misconceptions yeah. within time dilation. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, uh, of course. And I'm really excited about this paper. I think uh, it got published like a week ago or a couple of days ago. And uh, actually, I am uh, I have written this with a colleague in Melbourne. So it's an Australian colleague. Uh, and yeah, um, CEO, C and I um, have really tried to unpack what's going on when we talk about a relativistic time dilation. And usually we teach students or we, we tell each other that uh, time um, moves uh, more slowly or more quickly, depending on how uh, slowly or quickly you move yourself. But the way of saying this, um, often leads to misconceptions and the general problem with a relativity and trying to wrap your mind around relativity is that we don't really have an experience of relativistic phenomena and it's super hard to visualize. How are you supposed to visualize time dilation? What does it mean for time to, to or for clocks to tick more slowly or more quickly depending on how fast you move? And in this paper, we uh, draw a different, or we, we draw an important distinction between uh, the between observing and measuring a relativistic phenomenon. And this is really the idea because if you say uh, running clocks move slow, um, you don't actually see the clocks ticking more slowly. You don't see that you would measure it if you were to measure it as an observer. And a critical notion here is the notion of an observer. And here's a problem with language because like in everyday English, we talk about an observer and students and everyone knows what an observer is. But when we talk about an observer in uh, special relativity or in relativity more generally, uh, this has a really specific meaning and we shouldn't confuse the act of observing with just seeing something and seeing as photons hitting your retina or like taking a picture of something and we um we try to yeah unpack the, the this issue of um observing and measuring and we um we introduce an instructional strategy that hopefully will help teachers um, yeah, avoid this confusion and uh, give students vocabulary and terminology to avoid this conceptual confusion. Yeah, I really enjoyed the article. And I think that issue of language is a really important one. That's not just uh, about observing what an observer is. Um, and I think it's other areas as well. Now, uh, for our members of our audience, I'll publish a link for the article, I think, we could talk for ages about this, but that's not the intent of this uh, chat. But um, I'll put the link down the bottom and uh, it really encourage, particularly for physics educators, that you um, that you have an opportunity to, to look at it. So Magdalena, back to um, the subject at hand, which is really you. What got you into science? Was it a seminal moment in your life that just switched things on? Or was it something that you've always been passionate about? Tell us a little bit how you got into science. That's a great question. And I think it actually was a seminal moment. And my story is probably one that uh, many people can relate to. Because as a child, I always loved uh, watching the night sky. And it was this fascination with the stars and astronomy that really got me into to science. But I, in the beginning, I didn't really relate like watching the, the sky and pondering the universe um, as a child to, to science and to physics specifically. And I remember, uh, I think on my 12th birthday, maybe 13th, but I was 12 or 13 years old, and I got a birthday present, and it was this huge uh, astronomy picture book, like an illustrated book of uh, astronomy. And I absolutely loved this book, Paul. Like, I would uh, browse through it, and it had this... I was a little girl, and it felt like this, this uh, book was huge, probably half the size of me, but it had these um, fantastic illustrations and photographs of stars and galaxies and then little information text and I would read through it and 
I just completely fell in love and I just knew this was something that I wanted to do. So it was really uh, this birthday present that uh, got me excited. And then uh, from there, I just fell down the rabbit hole. I think I got Stephen Hawking's uh, Brief History of Time. And then I read Brian Crean and Michio Kaku and all those um, physicists and uh, physics um, communicators. And... So I think at the age of 12 or 13, I just had uh, set my mind on becoming a physicist. And this is what I did a couple of years later. And this is what I'm still um, passionate about. Well, and that passion comes through. Now, um, talking about um, science education or science communication, um, it, I think we will both agree, and most people agree, the importance of having good science communication, uh, not only for students, but at society at large too, I guess. Um, mm. well, how do you see your role in science communication? What's your views on the importance of science communication whether it's close by or in a broader context in terms of society? Mm. Of course, with my work, I want to have an educational impact. So it's one thing that I'm excited about these topics and I enjoy working on them and learning more <clears throat> about uh, physics. But of course, I, I want to have an impact with my uh, work. And I think science is awesome because science forces us to, to reflect on our actions and it forces us to, to think critically about facts and about uh, theories and ideas. So Science gives us a playground to play with abstract ideas and to test hypotheses and to really become better thinkers in a way and um, be able to navigate this world. I think at the end of the day, it's really about navigating this world and making sense of this world. And science is, of course, not our only playground and it's not our only approach to understanding the world but uh, it's one that's a lot of fun and that um, really um, brings us a long way and um, allows us to explore a lot so with uh, science education and science communication I hope I can I can contribute to helping um, people understand the world a little bit better, maybe become uh, critical thinkers and being able to just see how much fun it is to continue to grow and learn, not only as a student, but we are lifelong learners, right? And I hope that with my work that I really can help others um, see the beauty of science, see the excitement and... <laughs> I don't really want to say become better human beings, but in a sense, yeah, become better human beings and just, um, yeah, keep, keep learning, keep growing. You mentioned the importance of critical thinking. We can probably see there's a lot of evidence of a reticence of people to be critical thinkers. Uh, you see it in the media particularly and about uh, the discussions on various social media. Um, not an easy question. But do you see... Do you, we, we like difficult questions, Yeah, that's right. right. That's, that's, right. that's, that's, right. that's <laughs> right. So do you, what do you see in terms of how do, we, how do we get people to be encouraged to do critical thinking, to, you know, to, to have more, uh, to have uh, more considered opinions, particularly, I mean, Jeff, I spoke to last week, of course, and his particular uh, concern is particularly in the field of climate science, where there isn't a lot of critical thinking shown, particularly within the you know, society at large. Um, uh, do you have any thoughts of how we could possibly um, combat that? So, okay, I, I, I will step back from the climate science and just talk a little bit more generally of about course, critical course, thinking and scientific uh, literacy, because I think um, a lot of my ideas and what I'm going to say um, relates to different areas in science and different uh, socio-scientific issues, of course. And yeah, it's, it is indeed a, diffi a difficult question how we can raise scientific literacy and how we can uh, help people uh, become critical thinkers in a way, but also become active and participate because it's one 
it's one thing to be critical and it's easy to criticize, right? But it's a different thing to actually take actions and to participate in our society and try to make the world a better place. It sounds cliche, but how, how can we try to instill that in our students? And if I think about um, scientific literacy, because critical thinking is one part of, a, um, of a scientific literacy, I usually think about three levels. And this, is, this reflects in my educational pathway as well. So first of all, we have knowledge in science. So knowing about scientific ideas and scientific theorems and scientific concepts really. So this is our knowledge in science. But then there's knowledge about science. So you have to take a step back and reflect on the nature of science, the nature of scientific knowledge. How do we arrive at, um, at scientific ideas? What are scientific facts? How does, uh, how does our, understanding, our understanding get refined over time? And how can, how can scientists claim one thing and then maybe realize they made a mistake? Or going back to general relativity, was, was Newton wrong in suggesting his theory of gravity? Was he wrong? Can we say he was wrong? Or did Einstein only extend the scope of applicability uh, in, um, with his theory of, um, of gravity? So I think um, adding to, uh, to knowledge in science, this important dimension of having knowledge about science and knowledge about the scientific process. And then there's a third um, aspect to it. And I think this is knowledge to use science and knowledge to participate in our society and really being brave enough to not only stay in academia or stay in the classroom or wherever you are, but actually trying to see how the different pieces fit together. And just this idea that we have highly specialized disciplines, there's science and then there are the humanities and arts, they are not separate. And I think and this is something that we um, need to, to convey and we need to show students and the society just because you have an interest in science doesn't mean that you cannot have an interest in the humanities or that you are not a creative and imaginative thinker. So I think um, fostering critical thinking and promoting, promoting scientific literacy starts with building awareness that we need knowledge in science, knowledge about science and knowledge to use science. And getting back to my personal um, pathway, I feel like I have moved through these different stages because as a student, I immersed myself in physics and mathematics and I really learned this scientific knowledge and I loved it and I didn't need anything else. It was just me and science, right? And you know, you know that feeling. And then when I started my, my PhD in, in physics education, I was forced to learn about knowledge about science and gain knowledge about science. What is the scientific method? Is there such a thing as the scientific methods? And I feel like as a student, or as a physicist really, I took so much for granted and I didn't reflect critically on that. And these are assumptions, just being able to, to spell them out and being able to, to, to see that there are assumptions underlying physics and science more generally. So this is something that I really learned in, in my PhD. And now that I, I finished my PhD and I keep working um, on, on topics of science education and science communication, I really feel I'm starting to use my knowledge. Um, or I, yeah, I'm starting to use my knowledge in and about science to, to participate in society and to have impact and make a change. And this was, Paul, this was a really long answer too. <laughs> excellent answer, I might add too. A very excellent answer. Um, so we have students watching possibly who are thinking about science, further studies in science beyond the high school, maybe even a science hmm. career. What encouragement, what advice might you want to give to them? So I think uh, the most important thing is that you should do what you're excited about. And... Um, if, if you have this, this passion and this excitement for science, go with it. As long as you have fun and as long as you feel like learning science and learning more about science feels like playing, then you're on the right path. You have chosen the right path. And of course, I don't want to recruit every student into science. Like I'm not saying this is the only thing you can do, but 
my advice would be science science is this huge playground there's so much to play with there's so much fun to have and there you you meet great people along the way you get to to travel you get to exchange ideas and being immersed in uh, the scientific community is great it, it's not only the science but it's also about building connection um, building a community uh, or being part of a community so my advice um <laughs> Obviously, I'm biased, but I think my advice is if you're excited uh, about science, go go for it and just explore, read as much as you can. I'm an avid reader, and I think uh, reading, uh, reading and just reading a little bit more than just the course material and falling down many rabbit holes, like fall down as many rabbit holes as you can. I remember the first time I took a course in general relativity. Gosh, I think I spent my whole Christmas break reading books about general relativity. And um, you, you left a little bit confused maybe proust and confused but glad all the same because it's just yeah my i'm not sure like i'm 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 rambling but my advice is just um be excited be playful um read find people that just to fuel this excitement for, further so that you surround yourself with people who have a similar passion so that you don't feel alone but that you can really see that you're part of a community which is so important these days like what, what I'm in lockdown right like what what keeps me going is that I know there are you in Sydney and I have colleagues um like-minded friends all over the world so um find to find the right people surround yourself with the right people the right colleagues uh, and have fun with it your uh, your answer is surprisingly similar to jeff weiner's answer and <laughs> and it actually just is being a good scientist that uh, builds our reliability in terms of uh in terms of our argument here really is about really yeah, totally finding your passion and going down that rabbit hole and keep being asking questions and keep exploring mm -hmm. and that's just an intrinsic benefit you just enjoy the process of constantly learning yes it's hard sometimes yes it's challenging general relativity i still bends my mind pardon the pun but the the reality is that that's actually what fasc is fascinating about it it's far more exciting than i mean newton's laws newton's laws are important but there is something exciting about modern physics that drives you to want to know more to understand it better and so forth so totally agree with you um, mm. my last question is um an opportunity an opportunity for you to teach something that you are currently really passionate about. So uh, think of a topic, and it doesn't necessarily have to be physics education content, but if someone said something in mixed company, you go, I want to share something with you. What would that be? Okay, um, that would be a probably uh, embodied cognition, which is um, only partly related to science, but it's one of my current research interests. And I am briefly um, giving you an idea of what embodied cognition is and I'm showing you how I've used this in my research to understand how students make sense of abstract learning domains such as general relativity. And I think before I I start delving into uh, embodied cognition um, just to help um, listeners of years get an idea of what science education research entails. It, science education research is not only science. We do research about uh, scientific learning processes or how learners learn science, but the methods we use are not necessarily scientific in the strict sense because people are messy, right? It, it's easy. It's easy to study the world with the laws of physics and there are laws and there's mathematics, but you're a teacher, Paul. You know, learning cannot be studied in this rigorous way. People are messy and depending on the time of day or the temperature or like your general mood and if you've had your first coffee in the morning because for me it's, it's morning, right? And I need my coffee to, uh, to keep going. So um, 
studying humans is generally messy and difficult. And this is why we need different methods. And um, these methods come from the social sciences, they come from psychology, they come from neuroscience and cognitive science. And this brings me back to embodied cognition because uh, embodied cognition um, is um, a family of theories in psychology and uh, cognitive sciences and cognitive linguistics that basically tell you that we cannot understand learning and we cannot understand human cognition without taking the body into account. And this is something most people think if they hear the word cognition, uh, or learning, they think it's happening in our brains, right? There's our mind and our body has nothing to do with it. But interestingly, just the fact that we have human bodies and that we perceive the world through our senses and that our um, cognitive and conceptual systems really build on this biological basis and this embodied basis influences the way we think and influences the way we make sense of the world. So this is in a nutshell embodied cognition and um, ideas of embodied cognition have had a long philosophical history. I'm not going uh, into that, but uh, what is exciting about it is that it allows me uh, to unpack learning processes in uh, learning domains that are highly abstract. And this is general relativity, for example, because in general relativity, we talk about four dimensional curved space times. Can you visualize four dimensions, Paul? <laughs> it's super difficult, right? It's challenging. <laughs> Nope. And uh, even three dimensions can be difficult trying to, to make sense of three dimensional geometry. And um, in my research, I have found out or together with my colleagues, you never do research alone. Uh, we have found out that there is really a conceptual conflict between your embodied understanding of gravity and your embodied understanding of how you navigate our world. This on one hand, and then on the other hand, Einstein's abstract description or the abstract description of general relativity describing gravity, not as a force in the classical sense, but as the curvature of four dimensional uh, space time. And making sense of this idea, it's one thing to have abstract equations, but how do you understand this? And there's some uh, there is a, con um, yeah, a conceptual conflict between our embodied understanding and our abstract understanding. And this is something that I have explored uh, in my research and I continue to explore how we can use perspective of embodied, um, embodied cognition to help learners um, make sense of science, to help learners make sense of abstract ideas. And you see this relates to science but it's not really part of science. And if I was at a party, I would probably not be the cool girl because I would talk about philosophy and cognitive science and embodied cognition. <laughs> but this is something that um, I have a keen interest in these days. Is there a uh, future paper in this? <laughs> oh, I, I hope there are future proposal and grants and fellowships in it. So yeah, there are papers in the making. Um, there are actually one paper um, that I can share with you and maybe uh, you want to put it on your um, homepage as well, is a paper that we published probably already three years ago in which we uh, look at the famous rubber sheet uh, analogy. Like you have this, how can we how can we understand or visualize Albert Einstein's ideas? Well, four-dimensional curved space-time is like a stretched rubber sheet and you put bowling balls and marbles onto it. And I analyzed this, um, this model or this analogy and I used our studio students in Norway that we had worked with and I analyzed this and uh, this analogy from an embodied uh, cognition perspective to uh, give um, yeah yeah, to give just instructional ideas or ideas on how you can improve instructional uh, strategies in uh, general relativity. So yeah, there, there has been some uh, research going on and I hope there will be uh, a lot more in the next uh, months and years. Excellent, excellent. Well, thank you so much, Magdalena, for your time. Um, I think uh, we really got a sense of your passion for uh, physics education. I really appreciate you having a chat yeah. with me. Yeah, yeah, so, thanks, uh, yeah. thanks, Paul. Uh, uh, thanks and, so much for inviting me. I hope to have an opportunity to speak with you again. Thank you. Well, I hope you enjoyed this episode. Please subscribe to get notifications of up and coming interviews as well as my other physics content. My name is Paul from Physics High. 
until next time.